I love women who are wrong in the head. <laughs> well, a lot of your characters are a little bit that way. It's like, I want to say they're like morally ambiguous, but it's not. They're more like very honest. So I love like demented women and I love women who are bold and step out. This week's guest is a comedian, author, actress, my favorite sister on Grace and Frankie, host of one of my favorite podcasts, The Deep Dive. She's got a new movie coming out called Scrambled and will be on tour in February with her show, How Did This Get Made? It's June Diane Raphael. Hi. What a lovely introduction. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. You're a polymath. I am exhausted (laughs) by your intro. Well, thank you. As I'm really sad right now. I'm ha- so happy to be here, but Why? so sad because I have I have a sore throat and it started yesterday and here it is today, but I was like, you know what? I have a sore throat, you know? There's nothing to there's no way around it. Well, here's the thing. So, I know an absurd amount about you because you're one of my oh, favorites. God bless you. So, can we I love an origin story. How can we tell listeners how you got in to comedy. When did you know you were funny? Oh, well, I don't know that I'm funny. Well, no, but here's what I do know that I had I grew up in, you know, an Irish family, Catholic family. Although that's a whole other origin story about what I've just recently found out, which is that well, that that's a whole 23 and me story, but I that was our identity and so there was a lot of um there was a premium put on like storytelling and being able to make our parents laugh and being able to make each other laugh. Now, I didn't know that that was like a, a career. I don't know. I just knew that that was my mom would my mom at our kitchen table would have us crying, laughing stories about what happened at her school that day. And just and my dad. This is why like I, I grew up in such an egalitarian sort of world and Barbie world where, you know, my mom would make my dad laugh so hard he'd be doubled over. And so then like when I got into the real world and was like, oh, every improv team is I'm the only woman on, you know, it was so shocking because it was like I grew up and thought like, oh, girls are funny and we make men laugh, <laughs> you know, and we're also like the top 10 of our class. And our soccer team in high school is is state champion. Like, so it just was, like, actually quite shocking for me to enter into the world. And um, I felt very much so like Barbie. But, yeah, so I just, I think my family definitely put a premium on making each other laugh. And then I just always found women to be very funny. My girlfriends growing up, you know, it was just a baked into the DNA of my life and so it wasn't a realization much as just like oh that's that's how you relate but then when I got to college and started studying acting I knew I wanted to be an actor and I met Casey Wilson one of my dearest friends in a clown class you know with red noses she made me laugh so hard she's so funny she's so goddamn funny and so I then when we started like working together after NYU And honestly, the only reason we did that was because I was like, how do we get an agent? And maybe if we do scenes and like make a showcase, they'll come and see it. But what we found was and Casey was much further along in like the comedy world in terms of she was already taking classes at the Upper Citizens Brigade. She was already pursuing improv. I was always like my goal and dream is to be in Three Sisters off Broadway. Like that's all I that's as far as I can see. And so I really credit her to kind of pushing me and um, taking me with her in many ways. And so she was the one who really introduced me to UCB. And she was the one who was like, I, she had her eye on SNL sketch comedy, like that whole track. And I was just like, um, I thought it was fun, but it took me a little while longer to get into it or realize how actually, how much agency it gave us over our careers and what... You know, we started writing together. What a powerful thing it was. But ultimately, um, you know, I just found people who, who found other people who I thought were really funny and tried to work with them. So here's the thing. One of the first projects, big projects you two did together was doing the screenplay for Bride Wars. That's right. Right? That's right. 
Okay, which I, because I was excited to interview you, I rewatched. Oh God, it bless you! I haven't seen it in a decade. Oh my God, you were the mean regifter. Of course I was. I was crying. So here's the thing, though. There are so few. I I watched it and I was like, Jesus Christ! Like I remember seeing it in the movie theater. It came out right when I had gotten to the White House. Oh wow! And we would do anything to just. We loved going to the movies because it was just the two hours of peace of that we would get. Yes. And so I watched it and there are just so few movies like that now. Like where are the female buddy rom-coms? Can we get them back? Yeah, we can actually. Um, it's so hard. I don't really know how to answer that because like the film and TV industry is in such a state right now that I don't, I don't know where it's all going to like net out. Yeah, I really don't. But yes, we can. Yes, there's a interest in it. You know, actually, I will just plug Scrambled, which I have such a small part in the fact that I'm even... I watched it. It was fun. I really like that movie. And I feel like they're... I'm so proud of Leah McKendrick because she's a star of it, writer, director. And she got a theatrical release. And that's so rare. And that's so hard. And there's such an appetite. You know, it's funny, like I, women go to the movies and we want to see our stories. To- I remember when Casey and I were writing Bride Wars and being told by the studios, not the studio that we wrote Bride Wars for, but just at that point when we were writing and rewriting features, we did a lot of rewrites on features that were at different studios and would come in and punch it up or whatever. And the, the mindset then, which has shook me to my core and still does, was that when they're creating and investing, you know, $50 million, $30 million, whatever, into a movie, and they're looking at their the audience who's going to go see it and make their money back, women will watch movies about women, but they'll also watch movies about men. And they'll also follow male stories. But the opposite isn't true. And that scares me. <laughs> you know, and that was so, I'll never forget it when I heard that. Like, oh, well, men won't, they won't follow women's stories. Not interested in the narratives not interested in like learning about humanity and um and I think there's still real remnants of that which is like it's considered a niche market it's not great and now I think that's changing and I'm actually an optimist at heart I do think that's changing I think Barbie showed that I think for a lot of reasons that's changing I think generationally it's absolutely going to change I mean I, I have two sons who who watched Barbie and and are obsessed with it <laughs> obsessed so yeah, I really think that that's, that's going to be a remnant at some point, but I just don't think we're there yet. But comedy shows, let's talk about this for a second. TV is a great space for women. TV, and you have occupied some great space over the past couple of years. So many listeners will know you from playing Brianna Hansen on Grace and Frankie. So there's like a through line in a lot of your characters, but I am curious, what about the character of Brianna made you scream Yes. I had just had my first child when I auditioned for that role. I, I, it was one of the first times I left the house. I mean, and that's not an exaggeration because I wasn't auditioning for anything, but my agent wrote me and was like, this is special. Will you go in for it? And I was like, absolutely. And I think sometimes it's a telltale sign when you, as an actor, at least for me, when you can um, memorize the lines very quickly, like it's not a jump, it's not a leap. And, and I worked on the scene for, I, not a long time and I just was like oh I know her so well and that was it it was that was it and so I went in I did the scene I came out and then I got the call very soon after and it was like it was like that where it just was easy you know the thing that I love about Brianna and a lot of people I think when they meet me are like oh my god you're nothing like her and I'm And I'm not, but I have access to her, you know, and not to get too actory, but there's that thing of like, oh, one of the coolest things about being an actor is that you get real compassion for people and you're like, oh, everybody's capable of everything, the best and the worst. Because a lot, well, a lot of your characters are a little bit that way. It's like, I want to say they're like morally ambiguous, but it's not. They're more like very honest. Yes. And I. I, what I so appreciate about Brown is I was stepping into such a wild time in my own life and also working with such icons and people I respected so much that I was able to wear like her confidence. God, I just I love women who are wrong in the head. <laughs> and I love 
I really do. I love like demented women and I love women who are bold and step out. I think that we still have such rigid ideas about how women should behave, you know, and how they should sort of calibrate in the world. And so when I get to play someone who's, and I've been really lucky because those are the roles I'm drawn to. I mean, for a while in my career, I was getting offered like the role of the wife on sitcoms who's like, oh my God, I used to call her like Casey and I used to call that role the comedy killer who'd come in and be like, guys, don't be so crazy. Like my husband, like don't act like that. Like you're being really nuts. And it was just... I wanted to be nuts. You know, I wanted the jokes. I wanted to be wrong. And and I wanted the jokes. I wanted to to, to do the comedy. That was really important to me. And, and I'm so glad I sidestepped that because I think it's a real trap. I do gravitate for sure to women who are, you know, stepping outside of like that, those parameters, the social kind of cultural parameters that we are placed in and then sometimes we uphold and all of it I find it to be really fun and I I learn a lot from it about myself and yeah I'm just I'm drawn to those ladies speaking of ladies a lot okay let's you have worked with Jane Fonda Lily Tomlin you worked alongside Julie Louis-Dreyfus in Veep my favorite horny painter (laughs) Um, and you know, Julie Louis has a, has a podcast yeah. that I love called Wiser it's Than so Me. so good. And it's so, so good. good. And I have learned so much from it and I found it to be very powerful. And I am curious if like from them, what have you, what have you learned? What have you like, like taken away from your experiences with them? Well, first of all, I think the most powerful thing for me to, to walk away with is the idea that women we can reframe what it means to get older. We can create a story that's, I mean, I think the our culture would like love us to believe that we just will continue to lose from here on out. Lose income, lose power, lose our sexuality, lose, you know, our currency in the world. And what I've really learned and what I think is so it's what to me was so incredible about Grace and Frankie, which is it proposes that we might actually have more. We might have more to say. We might have more to do. We might have more investment in, in the world and wanting to leave it better than we found it. We might, you know, create structures that are that are different, family structures that are different. I mean, Golden Girls was my favorite show growing up. So this is actually not entirely, there's a through line here, you know, (laughs) from Golden Girls to Grace and Frankie. But I really do think that that has been really important to me. And I'm excited about it. You know, I'm excited to risk more as they do, as Jane and Lily and Julia do, to be more vulnerable, to be more committed. You know, Jane is, (laughs) Jane is something else and what I admire the most about her I actually saw this in my own mom too during her life which is the commitment to learning and spending her of herself uh spending her privilege which my god she does but the commitment to to learning and to offering and it's not a stopping it's not a retirement it is it's a double it's a double downing of of her herself and that's been a really she's been such a strong role model for me for that reason and also she doesn't suffer fools and it's it's really it's been important for me to be around her to see how she navigates the world because um she's been the object of sexual desire and so much hate still is you know and how she kind of finds her her center and all that is really beautiful to me. Um, And I'm just so, I feel so incredibly grateful to have, you know, these incredible, and also as artists, I I do find that as I get older, and certainly this is true of them, that we have more to say. (laughs) Like not, we have more to kind of share and we have access to more. You know, I find sort of the, the female artist to be a really interesting 
um, I don't know, to be an interesting character. And they've reframed it for me that, you know, sometimes I think that actresses get such a bad rap for being like selfish and vain and all this stuff. And like, listen, there's, there's, it's not that that's not a part of it, but when I've worked with Lily and Jane, all they're interested in (laughs) is telling the truth and sharing and risking. And it's very, very powerful to see. And that's, you know, I've had in my own work, I feel like I've had glimpses of what that feels like, but I'm, I'm not there and I want to, but I, but I'm so happy to have them because they get me closer to it. And I've seen a standard of performance that I will never forget and is now like a it's my standard, even though I don't always make it there. It's very cool. I think that there is something incredibly special about being around people who are special and you know it at the time and you're able to not let the moment pass you by. You can kind of just like soak it all in, you know? Um, now we're going to go like super low brown now oh, though. Fantastic. Are you ready? I've been okay. ready. So, no, and, and by the way, I'm not about to call your podcast low brown. But it, no, it is. <laughs> come now no the so the deep dive with jessica st Clair, another veep alum the pecorino queen um you should know that when i cannot sleep which is always because i'm perimenopausal all i do is watch veep so i know way too much um but do i remember your podcast runs the gamut do i remember you guys talking about sister wives of course Okay, great. So here's my question. I'm obsessed. I've watched every episode. As have I. Who's your fave? My favorite wife, Janelle. Janelle, right? We would be friends with Janelle. A thousand, I feel I am, but a thousand percent. Janelle is everything. She's everything. She's everything to me. Janelle is a feminist hero to me. Icon. Feminist icon. Truly. And before we go... You know, on this podcast, we love to talk politics. And you co-wrote the very positively reviewed book on Amazon, blurbed by Hillary Clinton, called Represent the Women's Guide to Running for Office and Changing the World with Kate Black, who is formerly at Emily's List. So right now, I mean, look, the world's a bit of a dumpster fire. But who are the women in office that you look at and you're like, yes, more, please? Well, you know, there's so many people. Like, I feel like the federal government gets so much, you know, um, airtime and so like there are people of course I could talk about but I and and this is a a big part of the book which is like all of the other seats that are available and that one might you know consider and I will say that there are some council members city council members in Los Angeles that I'm really excited Nithya Raman uh Eunices Hernandez that are real progressive voices and Nithya is up for re-election right now to lift how not only they ran their campaigns, but what they've been up to and how steady they've been. And they're changing, they're changing what the city council looks like in Los Angeles. And again, you know, we have a city strong council, weak mayor system, and the power that is here in Los Angeles and the power that these seats hold is so huge And then, of course, it's like, well, Los Angeles is a model city for the rest of the country. And so what happens here is going to impact other places. So to me, I those those are some of the women I've been most excited about. And because I see sort of I see how they've been doing it and I see how committed they are to their progressive ideals and holding on to them and working still within a really difficult system um, and I'm, I'm just feeling really proud to have supported them and continue to do so June thank you thank you thank you for coming on Hysteria listeners you can find June's podcast The Deep Dive wherever you get your pods and tickets for her show How Did This Get Made are on sale now thank you 